Ooh, I need three. <laughs> Are you laughing at me? I'm glad you debris. Yeah. <clears throat> I am only taking this off so you can hear me talk for now. Yeah, everyone, and good morning. This is, it's, no, it's good afternoon. This is state representative. I can see myself right there, and the mouse is in the way. Okay. All right. This is State Representative Doreen Carter, and I represent House District 92, and that covers parts of DeKalb and Rockdale County. And uh, for the remainder of this year, and in May, when we go, uh, when you go to vote, my district will be House District 93, and I'll represent DeKalb, Rockdale, and Newton County. So on my advertisement, I had to laugh at myself and just come clean with y'all. I put the sixth annual because I think I lost a year. I did not realize it was 2022. So guys, this is actually the seventh year that we've done a Go Red for Women event in House District 92. And so I want to uh, say thank you all for joining us. And we're going to start our program. We may be a little unorthodox today because y'all know me. I try to do way too much. So we have guests here with us in person. We have guests that are going to be live on uh, Zoom. And we have pre-recorded messages. So pray with me. We do it, we're, we're really doing this. And we pulled it off. I want to thank our team. Thank uh, Sequest and APD, a, a, APD and Stonecrest Resorts for hosting us here. We're live in Sequest at Stonecrest. So we're going to uh, bring on Dr. Jane Morgan, who has graciously been with us. I want to say what, this is the third year? I think so, third or fourth yeah, year. The third, the third year. So we're going to bring her on because Dr. Jane has a lot of information she wants to share with us. And uh, because it's Go Rare for Women, she's very, very, um, what is the word? Uh, a lot of people want to hear from her today. So Dr. Jane, I'm not going to take up any more of your time. Ladies, gentlemen, Dr. Jane Morgan, and she's going to share a lot of information with us today about uh, heart health, COVID-related, and some research information. So Dr. Jane, it's on you. Thank you. Thank you very much, Representative Carter. And I think you're right. This is the third or fourth year. So I am honored and pleased to be welcome back. Um, and I always enjoy this opportunity to really talk about heart disease and COVID. I am the executive director of the COVID task force for the Piedmont healthcare system here in Georgia. We are the largest healthcare system in the state of Georgia, 19 medical campuses. We cover 70% um, of the geography. We service uh, people in rural areas, in urban areas. And so this is um, a big uh, job as we began to sort of focus these last two years on COVID. I am a cardiologist by training. Uh, if you're wondering, well, why is she here uh, for the uh, Go Red for Women if she's on the COVID task force? So I'm a cardiologist. I'm a formerly trained cardiologist. I'm also a big researcher. And I like to say that I was just minding my own business when COVID hit. I was leading the cardiovascular research division at Piedmont, developing our trials, expanding to other hospitals, really thinking about what our strategy was going to be for developing clinical trials. I had expanded into transplant, organ transplant, um, lung, as well as oncology and pulmonary developing strategy, and then COVID hit. And I was redeployed like so many other people in my uh, position and throughout the hospitals. If you have heard of this, many people were redeployed and I was asked 
could you please lead this COVID task force? You're a physician, you've got a big research background. We need a voice that's going to help us understand what COVID is. What is the research telling us? What is the science telling us? And this is only going to be temporary. If you can remember two years ago, certainly in the hospitals, we were all just going to shelter in place for 90 days and allow this respiratory virus to pass. And so I was asked just to do this for three or four months, and then we would be able to just kind of resume our lives. So here I am, two years later, I never went back to leading the cardiovascular research program. I am continuing to lead our COVID task force. And so I began working with Representative Carter when I was in that role, and I'm continuing to work with her here. One of the things that I want to talk with everyone about is I like to discuss what some of the unknown risk factors are for women for heart disease, especially for Black women, but women in general that we don't think about and that are not discussed sometimes even from our primary care physicians. So did you know that when you are pregnant, this is actually your first heart stress test, your first cardiovascular stress test. If during your pregnancy, you developed a condition called preeclampsia, which generally is hypertension or high blood pressure, along with protein that's detected in your urine. And we generally see it after about 20 weeks of gestation, 20 weeks of that pregnancy. If you remember those words, preeclampsia. The another word to think about is eclampsia. If you develop that and then also had at least one seizure, or if you had something called PIH, pregnancy-induced hypertension. So if any of these words sound familiar, then in essence, you failed your first stress test. If you had a pregnancy that was complicated by preeclampsia, eclampsia, or pregnancy-induced hypertension, then not only did you fail your first heart test, that was an indicator that you were at risk for increased cardiovascular disease and complications later in your life. And after your baby was safely delivered, you should be referred to a cardiologist to be followed and to be managed because you have failed a stress test. Many people don't think about that, that volume overload of pregnancy, the volume overload on the heart and the multiple complications that can go along with pregnancies sometimes, hopefully your pregnancy is uneventful, but if you have uh, a pregnancy that is complicated by any of those conditions, or you were referred to a high risk OB to manage some of your conditions, including some of the things that we think of that are very common, uh, swelling of the legs. If that swelling began early in your pregnancy, as opposed to later when you're in the, in the third trimester and you had high blood pressure and they were talking about protein in your urine, you are failing your stress test and you must be referred to a cardiologist for optimal practice in managing yourself following the safe delivery of your baby. You should be followed by a cardiologist and be um, uh, assessed for whether or not you need to be managed on medications that sometimes we think of not only for high blood pressure, but for heart failure as a prevention. If any of this rings true for you, and yet you've never been referred to a cardiologist, then self-refer yourself with this history. Dr. So-and-so, Dr. Morgan in my case, Dr. Morgan, I am here today. I feel well, I don't have heart disease, but I had two pregnancies in the past, both of which I was diagnosed with preeclampsia. And I heard recently that I should have seen a cardiologist after that. So that's why I'm presenting today. These are things of which we need to be aware in order to take care of ourselves because the obstetrician and gynecologist, rightly so, is focused on delivering a healthy mother and a healthy baby 
during that pregnancy. That is their focus. And that is what they achieve at the end. And what I am saying is that following that successful effort by your obstetrician, you need to go to the next step and then say, now that I'm safe and my baby is safe, what do I need to do to take care of myself? I just failed my stress test. I need to see a cardiologist and be followed along with that cardiologist such that I can receive optimal care. One of the things that we have learned during COVID is that the time of a, uh, a uh, cardiac symptoms, let's say chest pain, but in women, these symptoms can be uh, different, but let's just say chest pain, the time from your first symptom to first contact with a medical institution regarding those symptoms has increased because of COVID. People are not going to the hospital as frequently nor as urgently. And what we have seen is we see worse outcomes down the road as well. We have seen fewer heart attacks, but we expect, we suspect that that is because of two things. One, people are having silent heart attacks at home and not seeking medical care. They're also being more sedentary, so unlikely to trigger any of the symptoms, right? Activity that causes any of these, um, any of these symptoms that might ask you to, that might um, indicate that you should seek medical care. And so as we see that time window expand, which we never want to see from the time, from your first symptom to, to when you actually contact the medical institution or some medical professional, increasing, not decreasing, that does not increase your opportunity for survival and outcome if you're delaying. And we certainly have seen that with COVID and we certainly see that in minority communities and specifically with women. Why? Because our symptoms are generally atypical. They can be. We don't necessarily get the crushing chest pain, shortness of breath. You, you pass out on the floor, you know, something dramatic where somebody's calling 911. No. What will happen? Eh, we feel a little tired. Um, we might have a little jaw pain, maybe a little back pain. That's the kind of thing you maybe will take aspirin or Motrin for. But really, you are having a warning sign of a heart attack. So we need to think about those kinds of things that fatigue that seems to always linger, that chronic back pain, this pain in your jaw. Maybe it doesn't actually hurt. It's just kind of annoying. It's always there. These are subtle symptoms sometimes in women of a heart attack. It may not be this dramatic 911 call where someone loses consciousness or has an elephant sitting on their chest. So we want you to always think about that and uh, step up and advocate for yourself because the symptoms in women may be mild. They might be subtle. They might be atypical. And unfortunately, still in the medical establishment, women's symptoms can be minimized or marginalized, and even more so with Black women, where we face other barriers when we are working on communication with physicians who um, may not have sensitivity to our experience. And our communication between the two, between the patient and the physician may be less than optimal. And it also could be that you feel that the physician is condescending towards you or is not taking your uh, symptoms seriously or is putting you down or uh, seems contemptuous or um, is not allowing enough time for questions. All of those are barriers to us receiving good medical care because you leave without actually getting the information that you need. And you also now don't have a good relationship with that physician and rightly so if that was the physician's behavior. But we have to continue to think about that and continue to advocate for ourselves as we're thinking about um, heart health. The other thing that I wanna talk about, as you know, I'm, I'm a big researcher is clinical trials. We have got to begin to think about clinical trials as a segue 
to improved health, certainly improved cardiac health, enrolling in a clinical trial increases your opportunities for better care within medical institutions. Why do I say that? If you are enrolled in a clinical trial, you are assigned a research coordinator or a research nurse who then gives you their phone number or email where you can reach them 24 hours a day. Think about that. Any symptom that you have, you can contact someone 24 hours a day. They want to know about it. We have to be able to document it. The data that goes to the FDA needs to be clean and every patient has to be watched very, very carefully. Where else do you get care like that? I'm a cardiologist. I can't even find anybody 24 hours a day. But within a clinical trial, not only do you have access to that, you have your physician taking care of you. You have the lead physician for the trial there taking care of you. You have the state or regional physician overlooking that doctor. You have the national physician overlooking the regional physician who's overlooking the local physician. You've got an entire team of people watching you. And those increased medical visits that oftentimes we use as an excuse or a reason for why we don't want to enroll in clinical trials, those are actually increased touch points with the medical system, with people who are helping you and watching you. Where else do you get that type of medical care at no cost? They are asking you to come in more frequently, to watch you more closely. That's not a burden. That is an opportunity for better care. And if you are uninsured or underinsured, here is your opportunity for access to health care. Because the pharmaceutical and device companies oftentimes will cover all of your expenses while you're enrolled in clinical trials that can go on sometimes for one or two years while they're doing follow-up. If you are struggling with insurance, clinical trials are your opportunity to make certain that you have great health care. And I would argue that if you are seeing a doctor for any condition, certainly a cardiac condition and absolutely for cancer, and you are not being offered an opportunity to investigate a clinical trial and enroll in a clinical trial, then you are being offered optimal medical care, everything to the top of FDA approval that is available to you. Hopefully your physician is, is, is giving that to you and advocating for you. But even though he or she is treating you optimally, if they are not offering clinical trials, you are not being treated maximally because that is the therapy that's behind the curtain that is invisible, not only to women, but certainly to communities of color and to black women. We are not offered these trials for a number of reasons. One, we are not sometimes seen in congruence with our physicians. White physicians may not necessarily reach out to their black patients for trials. That's why the majority of trials have whites enrolled. But also, if you are seeing a black physician in 80% of African African Americans are seen by African American physicians. Most of those physicians are not involved in clinical trials. Pharmaceutical companies don't recruit them. Device companies don't recruit them. Generally, our physicians work out in the community dedicated to our community and necess don't necessarily have a strong relationship to large medical centers where these trials are going on. And also, we cannot minimize the historical context of all of the atrocities that have been done against us, against our bodies, sacrificing our lives for the advancement of medicine and science of which we didn't benefit. Others benefited from our involuntary sacrifice and involuntary atrocities. But what I would say to that is part of the issue that we have with clinical trials is that we have not had any other information given to us since Tuskegee. The last we heard was Tuskegee. 50 or 60 years have transpired. We haven't gotten any other information. So it must still be the same. That was the last I heard. 
So if you want me to be in a clinical trial, the answer is no. So in part, that is our fault in the training for medical school as well for physicians. And so we need to begin to fill in those gaps. The way we are conducting clinical trials now is we have the oversight of all of these physicians. All of these people are watching you and watching each other. The companies need to make certain that the data is correct or they cannot get approval for their drug. Drugs going to market cost almost $1 billion for the company to invest. They do not want to get it wrong by mistreating you. And so we've got to begin to think about what is that quid pro quo? The companies get something out of it, but I get something out of it too. And if you have cancer, very specifically, cancer trials themselves, actually enrolling in the trial has been shown to increase the remission rate of cancers. And we have a higher rate of breast cancer, colon cancer. Why would we not enroll in trials that increase our remission rate? How much is two weeks of your life worth? How much is an additional month? How much is an additional six months that you might get or three years? Is that not of any value to you? Is it only of value to whites, but not of value to blacks? And so we've got to begin to think about this when we think about clinical trials and move away from exploitation to representation. And what does that mean? And lastly, as I close, I want to just uh, tie in what we're seeing in research with COVID with regard to heart attacks and strokes. We are beginning to see in the literature in the research literature and in some of our hospitalized patients that after you've had COVID and you are fine and you are healthy and you are discharged home, we're starting to see people have incidences of heart attacks or strokes following their episode of COVID. We know that COVID is a prothrombotic disease, meaning that it causes blood clots. We absolutely know that. We know that it is an endothelial disease, meaning it actually um, causes problems with the arteries of our body, including those that are going to the heart. In fact, in research, we actually refer to this as more of an endothelial disease and not a pulmonary disease. Most people think of it as a respiratory disease, but we know that we are seeing blood clots and we're seeing endothelial activation. Now, why after COVID has been treated and you have been discharged home? Are we seeing people return sometimes, rarely, with heart attacks or strokes? That is something that we're keeping an eye on, but we need to make certain that we are aware of that because certainly social determinants of health will continue to impact that. I started this talk talking about the time that it takes for you to reach a medical uh, establishment or to contact a medical establishment from your first symptom. That time has expanded and has even expanded more greatly for the African-American population, not accessing medical care for a number of reasons. We don't necessarily have a very trust, a trusting relationship with medical centers. And that's something um, from this side of the, of the train tracks that we've got to work on. Um, and so you might minimize your symptoms. Access might be an issue. But think about that as we're beginning to see there are some other effects of COVID following the diagnosis that could be impacting heart disease um, and stroke with uh, activation of our, our endothelium of our arteries and also with blood clots. And then I'll just close with COVID and saying that COVID um, has caused uh, three to four years uh, of uh, lives lost uh, from our lifespan. Fan. So we are the first generation to actually have a decreased lifespan, and that lifespan has been cut shorter in just two years. We've lost four years off of our lifespan, more so than any other group. Part of that is because of underlying medical conditions, chronic medical conditions that we are managing or mismanaging or not managing at all 
that are complicating our courses with COVID, including heart disease, including high blood pressure, including diabetes, obesity, cholesterol, all of this, um, all of this comes together to develop heart disease. We have these underlying medical conditions and we have seen that we have the most years um, of life lost than any other group in just two years. Finally, I will end with, I recently published a paper that looks at insurance carriers and the outcomes of African-American patients when they are diagnosed with COVID. One of, the, one of the results of this is that when insurances are equitable, private payer, commercial payer, Medicare, Medicaid, when insurances are equitable between the races for COVID, then outcomes seem to be more equitable. And so think about how important insurance and access to insurance is and what that means, uh, certainly for COVID, but how that might be able to be extrapolated. And I published that paper recently in the Journal of the National Medical uh, Association. So you can find that in the literature. You can follow me on Instagram. I'm at Dr. Jane Morgan, D-R-J-A-Y-N-E, Morgan, M-O-R-G-A-N. I'm on Instagram, I'm on Twitter, I'm on YouTube. I do one minute videos called Stairwell Chronicles where I take a single question about COVID or the COVID vaccines. And I answer that question in 60 seconds or less. I simply sit on the stairs of my house. That's my house, that's my phone, those are my clothes. I sit there and I talk with you in 60 seconds or less. I take one particular question and break it down scientifically in layman's terms make it understandable, demystify science. And each time you come to listen to me in my Stairwell Chronicles, hopefully you'll get another leaf that you can put on your branch. I, will, I have been uh, focused exclusively on COVID, but for this month, Black History Month and Heart Health, starting February 21st, I am going to do a Heart Health series for that week. One minute videos, feel free to tune in. Dr. Jane Morgan, Instagram, Twitter, YouTube. I'm also on LinkedIn as well. I appreciate it. Thank you, Representative Carter, for inviting me. I always enjoy it. <clears throat> I love the work that you are doing, uh, Representative Carter, and I appreciate the invitation. It's an honor. Thank you. I you think go. your volume is off. There you go. Oh. Yeah. I was saying thank you. I know thank that you're busy because this is a huge, huge day for Heart Health. Thank you so much for always joining us, giving us amazing information. And we're going to have to do one of those 60 seconds time to talk live on Facebook together. How about that? I love it. <laughs> thank you, dear. Bye, right, guys. See ya. Yay. Thank you all. I feel like this is so unorthodox. So like, you know, I feel like I'm like super hot check or something. But listen, so um, so anyway, so in our program, as we're gonna continue, we're gonna we're almost um. shared is can y'all hear me they can hear me i don't like that sad you know okay let me try to cool. so um so go red for winner is the american heart association signature event where they bring awareness to women uh with heart disease and so we have someone from the american heart association she'll talk, talk to us a little bit but what we've seen over the last couple of years is that instead of Heart-related deaths decreasing, they're going up. And so y'all really know what it is other than we just got doing So over the last year, I think it's this death, heart-related deaths have increased by 4.8% and stroke-related deaths have increased by 6% over the same period of time. So I consider myself on my third life because I am a walking miracle. So I had a heart attack in 2015 and a stroke in 2020. And I am thankful to God that he has allowed me to see Jesus. So um, to wonder, share that. But then those of you who were with us last year, 
should notice something different. This year, yes, it will be like 50 pounds less. <laughs> You know, over the period, and my friend, who we started uh, President the Champion, Governor Chief, um, you know, it's like eating out with it. So she kept losing weight, and we were eating out, and I was like, what's up? And she finally told me, so I did uh, this process with Dr. Joe, but we can talk about that. Uh, so anyway, so I've lost uh, 50 pounds. The next time y'all see me, I'm going to lose more. But in that time, I have uh, come out two of my high blood pressure meds. I say uh, half the doses in the tomato roll and then half one other doses. Mm. So I can tell you that just eating right. We are, you know, we hear to talk about, you know, food is our medicine. I am a testament that my food has absolutely been my trigger for life or my uh, entry to death. And so just eating right, exercising, I'm going to do better. So I got us a physical fitness person here with us. And then Dr. Turner told us about the self care because that's to do with all of that. If we don't figure out how to relax and just enjoy life, it still is phenomenal. So I don't think I'm going to talk about anything else because I want to keep us on schedule. So we have uh, lunch, and you guys can grab lunch, but we have our uh, sponsor for lunch is Emory the University Hospital. And we have Miss Kendra Price. Is Kendra on there? And so, Kendra. Hi. If you want to, uh, I think we're trying to figure out how to get you on camera. Or it's just going to switch to speaking. Okay. So, Kendra, if you want to take a couple minutes and greet the people, and y'all say thank you. Because I, you know, Kendra loves me. Because I call her like this morning and say, Kendra, we need lunch because she's there. But I gave her two days. <laughs> Good to see you. <laughs> and thanks for having me. I'm Kendra Price. I actually work for Emory University in the Office of Government and Community Affairs. And that means I'm a liaison between the community and the hospital and the university. So all things Emory. Yes, I'm here when Representative Doreen calls me. Happy to help and support you and however I can. And um, if you need anything, we're right down the street at Emory Hillendale Hospital. Emory Decatur, as well as Emory University Hospital on Clifton Road. So thank you for having me and we appreciate you. And Representative Carter, we've done these a few times for you. So I, I feel like they're very informative and educational and very helpful. So thank you for all that you do for the community. Thank you. All right, so now we have... Uh, Thank you, dear. We appreciate you. You're welcome. Now we have uh, attorney Nisi Johnson. She's going to be our next presenter, and she has a PowerPoint. And uh, wait a minute. Hold on. I'm so out of protocol. We have our commissioner. But we a sixth district here. So while we think that our commissioner is a reading age daughter, we just need some to read the people. I'm doing too good. Okay, get on. Yeah. Somebody else want to speak? Good afternoon, everyone. And thank you for my dear friend, uh, Norman Thomas. I mean, this is very special to put on in our community. And it's very dear to my heart because my sister uh, had heart disease. Uh, she had a heart attack when she was. Uh, she was about 30 years old, and the Lord spared her uh, to live uh, another 35 years. And so I do understand the necessity to educate uh, our community, to eat right, and sometimes it's hard, but we must do it. So, Doreen, I'm going to have to follow you because I know your weight also has. Uh, a direct effect on your condition. And so uh, when Snap Finger, the Y was in the community, YWCA of Snap Finger, I would go there uh, three days a week uh, for water aerobics. And they have moved and I haven't, I mean, they have closed. I haven't been there 
since they have closed, but that tells you the importance for us to have facilities in our communities that we can utilize and get healthy. And uh, so I appreciate uh, uh, Representative Doreen Carter for 